portion provider appreciation day. So thank you on behalf of Marie and I and so many people for the work you do uh, for the healthcare for so many women in, and uh, the difference that you make. So let's give them a round of applause. You know, every single day it feels like we wake up with some kind of new attack. And I know that we heard from Republicans that they were just going to overturn Roe, let the states decide, and that has not happened. We continue to see states turning over horrific, um, putting a horrific ban after ban forward that really is jeopardizing so many women's health and lives. Uh, we're seeing our new attacks on women's ability to get medication, abortion, birth control, and a lot more, which is why on Abortion Provider Appreciation Day, I just, again, want to thank every single one of you who does this work in and out um, for people here in our state and for people who are fleeing at other states as well. So thank you. Um, you know, last year we should have been celebrating 50 years of Roe v. Wade. And instead, we have watched these Republicans now do ban after ban and go after IVF, uh, birth control, and really basic family planning services time and time again. And we're seeing it in Congress, and we're seeing it in, in states. And now we are seeing them go after the ability of patients across the country, including here in Washington State, the ability to get microcrystone. This has been on the market for 20 years. It has been proven safe and effective, and we know that it is used by most women, or the vast majority of women, who access abortion, and now they're trying to take it away from every woman in this country. Uh, and I am concerned, Maria is concerned, we're here today to hear from all of you, but also to say, we are going to fight this back. Um, you know, we're, we know that there is a judge in Texas who's about to make a ruling on Michael Christo, and uh, if he rules the way we hear, it will impact women right here in Washington State. Uh, and now we're seeing Republican AGs threaten pharma uh, pharmacy chains uh, for, for, for providing a FDA-approved medication, and we are fighting back there. Marie and I, along with a number of senators in, uh, in, in this, members of the Senate, are sending a letter to Walgreens next week to tell them that we expect them to um, have this drug available and to let women know uh, that it's available and how to get it and that they cannot be intimidated by Republican AGs. They need to follow the law and to make sure that we have access. We're also sending a letter to all the other chains telling them we are watching what they're going to do. Uh, Walgreens set out a really misleading difficult to understand um, statement last week and what we're telling them they need to clarify it and they need to have this drug available for women in their health care. Um, so all of that together, I want you to know on a positive step, in the Senate this last week we introduced the Women's Health Protection Act. It's a pretty simple bill. It just gives patients the right to get an abortion. It makes sure that doctors have the right to provide abortion care uh, no matter where in America they live who their doctor is or what their circumstances are. And I'm very proud that we have 49 co-sponsors in the Senate this time around. So we are moving, uh, you know, doing as much as we can to keep that bill moving. Knowing that the politics are challenging in Congress right now, we're going to keep lifting up our voices and fighting back with every way we can. So we are doing a lot, but we're here today to hear from all of you because your stories matter. What you tell us and what's happening with patients allows us to tell their stories as well. And so I really appreciate all of you who are here today and uh, thank you again for being a part of this. And now I will turn it over to Senator Cantwell who's been a champion for women and women's rights since the day she was sworn into Congress and uh, I'm proud to have her as my partner. Well, thank you, Senator Murray, and thank you for your leadership. Senator Murray is the top women Democrat on the Health Committee, and trust me, her voice has been loud and clear every single time when a women's access to health has been challenged. Patty Murray has been there. In fact, I would like to tell the story of once when they were doing a budget bill where men were trying to undercut women's health care. Patty stormed the Capitol. You <laughs> have to let her into the room to have the discussion, and she was very successful in holding up, making sure that our health care issues were addressed. So thank you for that continued leadership. It's great to be here with Rebecca 
and thank you for your leadership at Planned Parenthood and the other providers and storytellers that are going to be here today and obviously with our Attorney General who has just arrived. I too want to thank everybody for abortion providers and to say thank you. We appreciate you, we appreciate what you do, and we want you to know that without you, many, many women would not be able to exercise their reproductive freedoms. And so thank you for what you do. We're here at a time when, even though in Washington in 1990s, we voted to codify Roe v. Wade into law, we can see that the actions of others are starting even to affect the healthcare delivery system right here in Washington. And that is why we are fighting back. That is why, as Senator Murray said, we introduced the Women's Reproductive Act this week, and we are going to fight to try to get it voted on in the United States Senate. That would create a federal codification of Roe v. Wade and would stop the kind of actions that are eroding these rights today. We know that patients right now are struggling to receive care, and that's not just happening in places like Idaho and Texas, it's even having an effect right here. Pharmacists who are supposed to dispense medication are afraid that they are going to be harassed or sued and are stopping giving women access to their full reproductive choice. We must take bold action and hold these pharmacies accountable. A reproductive health care uh, doctor on Whidbey Island whose patient had gone to four different clinics to fill a prescription for the medical abortion drug Mifeprostil was told, we're not stocking that, please don't come back. This affects individuals in our state, and that is why, along with Senator Murray, I'm joining her letter to ask these providers what their plans are so that we can hold them accountable for providing access to this drug. As Senator Murray said, it was approved by the FDA in the year 2000. It's extremely safe. And it is a major way, 55% of pregnant women in Washington state who get an abortion use this drug. So if pharmacies aren't going to stock it, if patients aren't going to get access to their need here, how are we living up to our 1990 codified law in the state of Washington? So we're very concerned that pharmacies are taking this action and that is why we have sent Senator Murray's letter to them making sure that smaller pharmacies in our state don't refuse care to Mifeprostin, possibly because they are fearful of getting sued, and that larger pharmacies don't prematurely weigh in on the issue and unnecessarily affect the access to the drug in Washington state. We all know that there are lawmakers who are trying to chip away at our rights by limiting safe and legal access to abortion medication but we're here to say we are going to fight back. We are going to continue to fight to make sure that this FDA approved drug is available here in Washington state. That the people who need access to this are going to continue to get access. I also want to say that in this past period of time, we have also seen how our service providers feel the fear of of criminalization. In another uh, one instance, last month the Idaho legislature would make a crime to punish punish by two to five years for helping <coughs> someone minor get access to telling the stories that we want to tell in Washington, D.C. We want safe legal abortions to be available here in Washington State, and we want the drugs that also provide that level of care to be available here in Washington State. So thank you, Senator Murray, and I look forward to hearing the comments of everyone at the round table. We were going to kick it over to Dr. Berry, but I forgot to have her back. So, <laughs> Quite all right. All right. <laughs> so I too want to echo my thanks and appreciation um, for everyone being here today. A special thank you to Senators Murray and Cantwell uh, for your unrelenting leadership to protect abortion access and, and reproductive health care access in Congress <laughs> and to Attorney General Ferguson for your relentless fight to protect and expand abortion access right here in Washington. My name is Rebecca Gibron and I am the CEO for Planned Parenthood of the Great Northwest, Hawaii, Alaska, Indiana, Kentucky, and also right here in Western Washington and my home state of Idaho. Um, as we 
we know, since the Supreme Court eliminated the fund fundamental right to abortion access last June, our Planned Parenthood health centers in Washington have seen patients travel from both near and far to, uh, 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 to get abortion access. Since Roe was overturned, our health centers here in Washington have seen patients from Idaho, Utah, Oklahoma, Tennessee, Texas, um, and, and beyond. Our patient navigators have helped countless people across the country access abortion care in the six states that we serve. They're on the front lines of this work, talking directly with patients to help them understand the laws in their states and helping them access the resources they need to travel and to get care. But we know the attacks against reproductive care did not end when the Supreme Court overturned Roe. Extremist lawmakers in my home state of Idaho are currently jamming through legislation that would criminalize helping minors access abortion here in Washington. In Texas, we're currently waiting on a, con on a conservative judge to make a decision in a case that would mean mifepristone, a key step in the medication abortion regimen, would be taken off the market nationwide. And while we're ready to shift to misoprostol only medication abortion, we know the harm that it will cause our patients that we serve in our affiliate. That's why we're here today. And your commitment to advancing abortion rights in DC and in Olympia are more crucial now than ever before. I'm really grateful and look forward to the discussion we're having here today and to hear the stories directly from our patients and our providers about the work that we can do right here in Washington State and how you can help us in Congress to further protect abortion access. And with that, I will turn it to Dr. Karen Berry. Thanks so much, Rebecca, and thank you all for having me here today. Um, my name is Erin Berry, and I'm an OBGYN physician and a complex family planning specialist. I'm also the Washington Medical Director here at CCG and HIFK, um, as well as the Director of Clinical Research. In my role at this affiliate, I treat patients primarily in Washington State, but also in Idaho, and actually wherever we are needed. <laughs> um, and in my provider, I've been a provider for about 15 years now, um, and I've, I've really never experienced anything like what I've in the last nine months, and I really fear for what's to come next. Abortion is safe and normal, and it's 100% legal in Washington State, but the political climate has more than seeped into my exam room. It's now routine for patients to ask me um, if it's okay to talk about this in my state. They're scared to tell us where they're from in fear of legal retaliation. Um, and hearing the legislation come out of Idaho right now, as well as things going on in Texas, it's not hard to understand why patients are scared to be truthful in the exam room. They're scared of what's going to happen next. They're, um, they are, you know, it's constantly in fear. Um, and I, myself, am on tech to be in constant alert too, for threats against my clinic, my staff, and even my family. Um, I regularly reassure patients that they can tell their providers and their OBGYNs back home that they have an abortion, a safe and legal abortion here in Washington. Um, and that everything we are doing here is legal. And that does bring them some comfort. Um, but I understand their confusion and their fear with these constantly changing laws and the anti-abortion propaganda and the and misinformed media headlines that sometimes occur. It's no wonder people are confused and scared. As Rebecca said, we have patients coming from visiting our clinics in Washington right now. And while some try to paint this as a safe rights issue, we know it's not that simple for many patients. Not that long ago, I had a patient travel thousands of miles to come here and get planned in Washington. Had to stay with a friend for friends, take time off work that she couldn't afford, had to disclose what she was doing to people she didn't really want to disclose in order to help with the logistics, only to have a, a miscarriage on every day. She was just like, I can't believe all I've had to go through to get here for this reason. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, things like that are not rare throughout the state anymore. This is our everyday. 
The model is a time for action to protect patients and prior in Washington State. As states around us have been emboldened to go after abortion providers like myself and my colleagues, along with patients and people that trust them, we're depending on your leadership to keep us safe and safe. So thank you. And now I'll pass on to um, Anjali de la Roche from Hummingbird Bank. Um, and it's really good to be here with you all today to be having this important conversation. In the United States, the mainstream narrative around reproductive health centers on the idea of choice, usually in terms of choosing to continue a pregnancy. And what we know is that nationally, for black and indigenous people of color and immigrant communities, and globally, the realities are much more complex. Stigma, lack of access to care, lack of comprehensive sexual education, lack of gender affirming care and legality of barriers to safe abortion access can contribute to unnecessary health outcomes and complications for what's otherwise a straightforward and uncomplicated procedure. Abortion restriction is associated with increased maternal mortality, increased rates of gender-based violence, unsafe abortion because we know that people will continue to seek this critical and basic health care, and decreased perinatal care. And of course, the health outcomes for black and indigenous peoples are worse than for benefits while we will fight every step of the way to continue to ensure that our families have access to full spectrum perinatal care, we also recognize that abortion access is not the end all be all of reproductive equity and rights. In the words of Audre Lorde, there is no thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. The right to choose when and how to bring new life into the world has always been an indigenous value. And for as long as people have been having children, they've also had the technology to not have children for the health and safety of the birthing person, the family, and or their community. Equally important in the conversation on abortion access are increased social supports and connections, coordinated care systems to decrease interruption of services, transportation to medical services, access to internet, equitable pay, housing security. That is why our abortion fund for indigenous relatives living in rural Washington or states with restrictive abortion access covers all stages, covers transportation, and covers childcare. We view attending an abortion with a relative as sacred as attending a birth. We understand that these attacks on reproductive freedom, the recent wave of anti-trans legislation, and the threats to the integrity of the Indian Child Welfare Act are all part of a legacy of colonial violence. We understand that the erasure of indigenous peoples and anti-blackness is foundational to the workings of the American government, and that this restriction on abortion access is one more way to continue to exert control over black and indigenous Hummingbird Indigenous Family Services is the first and only full spectrum doula program to exclusively serve indigenous communities in King and Pierce County. We want all our relatives to feel cared for. It doesn't matter the circumstances of why someone is getting an abortion. What matters is that they have the resources to access high quality care, are supported throughout their journey, and have the space to heal physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. One of our abortion doula clients shared with us after receiving support I want you to know how much your care and support in this time has made a real difference in my experience. I feel more capable of caring for myself and of healing, and that is such a gift at a time when everything feels so tempting. We are so grateful to all of the panelists here for the work that you do, and to Senator Murray's office for the invitation to speak on these issues about the work that we do. Now more than ever, we need to work together to create and uphold the policies that support our families and communities in gaining progress over their own reproductive rights. My name is Sarah Prager. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist as well as a complex family planning subspecialist at the University of Washington Medical Center. And I want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing at the University of Washington, which is very similar to what Dr. Barry was describing at Planned Parenthood and in Washington State in general. Uh, we're definitely seeing an increase in the number of patients coming from other states and not just Idaho and Alaska, which were primarily the states we saw patients coming from previous to June, but also lots of patients coming from Texas 
and Louisiana and Mississippi and really anywhere um, that does not now have access to abortion care. And we're very happy to provide this care and we're also cognizant of the fact that it does in some way reduce access to our Washington State residents who are also seeking abortion care. And so we're really trying to balance all of that. At the University of Washington, we also see a lot of critical patients. And so we're seeing the impact of the Dobbs decision also on patients who are experiencing ectopic pregnancy, patients who are experiencing miscarriage. And we're seeing that the Attorney General call for his seat. Right, So what I'm going to chat about just briefly is what's been referred to as this lawsuit in Texas um, that is, if successful, would place a nationwide ban on access to Metaprista, which, as you mentioned, is more than half of abortions are done through using Metaprista in Washington State and across the country. And just to put a fine point to it, it's not an accident that this case was filed in Texas. The anti-abortion activists who are hurting the lawsuit filed it in a very specific federal court in Texas for one reason. They knew precisely which federal judge would hear the case and make that decision of impact reproductive freedom for people all across the country. It's a judge whose public views on reproductive freedom are, let's just say, not aligned with the honest room or the people of the state of Washington. And so we, of course, are at losses against the federal government, the FDA. States like Washington joined in supporting the FDA in defending access to the crystal. But in giving some thought to this, um, I talked to my team and Kristen Vanesky who's standing in the back, uh, who helps lead the effort in our team. Um, we've been giving thought to what can we do not only to maintain reproductive freedom for people in our state, but also increase it. And Mr. Crystal has been a conversation we've had because the FDA places restrictions on its availability. And to give you some sense of context, the FDA has approved over 20,000 drugs, I think it is. 60, 60 have restrictions on them. The other, 20,000 did not. Um, the drugs that have limitations, restrictions, are inherently dangerous, like fentanyl, for example. Um, Viagra, interestingly enough, has no restrictions. <laughs> Mifepristone does, even though medically it is shown to be as safe as taking Tylenol. And so the team came with the idea of, hey, we should potentially think about a lawsuit against the FDA that seeks to eliminate those restrictions actually increase access to it because there's no justification for having these limitations which have a real impact on, on making it available for people in our state. So we decided to file a lawsuit here in Washington State in the Eastern District of Washington. We've now been joined by a coalition of 17 other states under District of Columbia. So it's a large coalition of states who are joining us in our lawsuit that we filed here in Washington State. So if this judge in Texas issues a national injunction, we have the ability to get in front of this judge in the Eastern District of Washington to maintain the access, even increase the access in Washington State and the other 17 states that have joined us in our lawsuit. So it's obviously a critically important uh, lawsuit in Texas and here. Um, I think what I just would say is that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's clear in the post dog world, it's my view that uh, anti abortion politicians, anti abortion activists, anti abortion organizations will literally stop at nothing until they have removed every last vestige of reproductive freedom for the people of this country. I'm convinced of that. Mm -hmm. There is no reasonable argument to have with them. There is no reasonable discussion. There is no reasonable hunt. No, they will stop at nothing. And that's why even in post dogs lawsuits like this one in Texas can reach into Washington state or thanks to the leaders we have and the people that say that it's safe and legal to have an abortion, yet they will strip away those protections as well if they have their way. Um, and that's why this case is so important. The other thing I just want to mention briefly is the state legislature is doing some great work on trying to protect um, privacy information around these issues as well. We have a bill that I propose that's moved through the State House of Representatives called My Data, uh, my, my Information, My Data, My Privacy Bill, which does the following. If you go to a hospital, of course, your information is protected. You know, HIPAA protects your information being released. Unfortunately, um, and this is what this bill, My Health, My Data, does is if you use an app, for example, to track your care, so you go to use an app, which is very common, that information, that private information that you have placed with that app can be 
sold or given away by that entity to anybody, to some prosecutor of a state that was held bent on prosecuting um, for seeking a full range of reproductive freedom. So what this bill does in a nutshell is essentially adds the protections, privacy protections around all sorts of things that are outside that, that patient doctor conversation at hospital and applies it to many other contexts. It's moved through the House and we're optimistic we'll get through the Senate as well. But it's a very important bill and uh, in the organizations like you've really been obviously huge supporters of helping get that through. So you know the team's working really hard on these issues, um, as you might imagine, on the policy side, but also the legal side. And we're joined by coalitions of like-minded states and the team that work to uh, to make sure that you know your story is as different as it is mine. I can send our attorney back yeah, to you. Well, Senators, you mentioned uh, up front the Walgreens situation. I'm sure you're aware of what California is doing. Mm -hmm. What can be done at the federal level to exercise similar leverage over chains like that? Well, what we are doing right now is um, asking Walgreens to make it very clear what their policy is and telling them that we expect them to provide a FDA-approved drug um, to their patients and to let their patients, even in those states where it is illegal, to know what their access points are. They're, the, what they put out was confusing and uh, and they need to clarify it and they need to make sure they're on the right side of this. And they were vowing to um, some Republican attorney generals were letting them know there's pressure on the other side. Well, is there anything you can do to force the issue with a chain like that? Well, I don't know that we can force it by some law. Right now we don't have the votes, but we can force it by public pressure. Mm -hmm. Women have a right to know. Senators, you also mentioned, I just wanted to uh, get some more clarification with the Women's Health Protection Act and how I think, Senator Cantwell, you said that it would, um, if, if passed, would provide some federal complications to the overturning of, of Roe v. Wade. And so could you kind of walk us through that a little bit more? Um, what, what does that mean, those complications? I'm not sure what you're asking. What the Women's Health Protection Act does is codify Roe into law so that women in every state in our country We believe that this is a right to privacy that exists, and we think that this is a codification of the issue at the federal level that needs to happen given the Dobbs decision. We want our colleagues on the other side of the aisle that support abortion rights and reproductive freedoms for women to stand up and pressure their colleagues to give us this vote. Do you think with that in mind you'll have the vote? I think that that's what women across America 
said in the last election, they want to see that happen, and we're going to fight until it happens. And I would want to respond again on Walgreens in that um, they are doing, the, uh, they're re reacting to uh, public pressure, but also to the court case that uh, Attorney General Ferguson talked about, um, and the fact that uh, he is fighting back the right way. 